Thank you, Eric. Once again, good morning. There's, uh, there's nothing wrong with egos for dinner. It's nothing to do with the message. I'm just saying, you know, dads, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, did, is that was that recorded? Oh, no. <laughs> but we didn't have egos. Um, I mean, some of y'all may have men have had egos last night. It's okay. No, no it's good. Um, it's also, I've, I've heard, and I think this is true. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 16 today, by the way. I've, I've heard this is true. Um, if you eat ice cream for dinner, when, when, you know, a few times in a row, that's not going to kill you either. Uh, anyway, let's move on. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I'm just, you know, two hours of sleep last night with our kids. What a, you know, <laughs> you need a Bible. We got some folks in the back. If if, uh, if you need one, just raise your hand. They'll come by. First Samuel 16. Um, one more announcement. Um, just wanted to share with you guys. Uh, Thursday, May the 5th, coming up very quickly, uh, is National Day of Prayer. And uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, we have an opportunity uh, to gather with other believers on the King George County Courthouse lawn that day. That is a Thursday, uh, May the 5th. It will be at 12 noon. And um, uh, keep your ears on. Uh, we don't think that's going to change. I'm pretty sure that's, that's what it's going to be. But, you know, we'll have an opportunity to gather out there and, uh, and pray for our local leaders, pray for state leaders, national leaders, pray for the world. Last I checked, we live in a world that's in some major need of prayer. And uh, what a neat opportunity it is to gather hearts with believers around our country that day uh, to kind of pause and, uh, and, and pray. So I invite you guys to come out. I'll be there and uh, just kind of, you know, being a part of that and, and uh, welcome you to come out. It's not terribly long. I think it usually lasts 30 to 45 minutes or something like that. It's less than an hour. Uh, but at any rate, you know, what a neat time to, to just come together. So I invite you to do that in a couple uh, Thursdays from now, uh, May the 5th, right there in front of the courthouse. Uh, today, 1 Samuel 16, let me just pray one more time. I just want to pray once again. Father, thank you, God, for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for the timeliness of your word, Lord. And uh, God, we are, we are just grateful to know that we can gather here every Sunday. Father, we, we thank you for, for Principal Monroe. We thank you for Miss Judy. We thank you for the staff here at King George Elementary. And their heart of, of just their cordial heart to, to have us here, Lord, we're grateful. And we're grateful for Pineview, and we're grateful for uh, the people in King George County and the opportunity that you give us week in and week out, day in and day out, to be salt and light, hands and feet, uh, right here where we live, Lord. Uh, and Father, it's all about your word, God. All that we are, all that we do, uh, Lord, comes from the truth of your word, Lord. We believe it. We stand on it. We teach it. We want to live it. God, we want to live it out, God. We want others to see you through us, Lord. So I pray uh, in respects to those thoughts, Lord, that you would open our hearts this morning as we open these verses in 1 Samuel, God. And just have your way in us, Lord. We, we pray you would teach us, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last time uh, we, we took the first half of 1 Samuel 16, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, we frequently do that, do we not? We look at a situation and we're quick to make a conclusion. And I uh, think we, we see the whole picture when oftentimes we don't see any of it. And uh, we saw some of that. Samuel was still mourning over Saul. Remember, Saul had, was just in the process of, of just turning his back on God and walking away, greater and greater disobedience. And, and Samuel, you know, had been a part of anointing Saul, and Samuel was down. He was down about that, and I would have been down about that too, you know. And he was kind of, you know, just really taken aback by that. And, and, and as he's mourning for Saul, God says, hey, come on. You know, I get it. There's a time to mourn, but it's time to lift up your head. It's time to put oil in your horn because you've got to go anoint another king. There's work to be done. And we talked about how sometimes even in the midst of heaviness, uh, there is a time to mourn, but we have to get up and go. We have to continue moving forward with what the Lord has for us and trust him that he'll help us get there because, no, it's not always easy. So God told Samuel that, and of course he was a little bit afraid that Saul was going to go off and kill him. And uh, certainly we're going to see Saul resort to some antics like that as we continue to study his life he's going to chase David uh, like crazy that was a neat thing too about being in Israel I'll show you plenty of pictures when we get to this section in the word but we got to walk the hills and enter the caves very much could have been the caves where Saul was chasing David where David was hiding it was pretty treacherous terrain uh, but we'll see that so Samuel or Saul rather is is uh, starting to go off on the deep end if you will um, God had reassured him though that, that that he was in control so Samuel 
goes to Bethlehem like God had told him to to the house of Jesse and, and, and calls for his sons. And all of Jesse's sons were paraded in front of, of Samuel because Samuel knows he's going to anoint a king from these, these kids. Of course, God didn't tell him which one at first. You know, God tells us enough we need to know, doesn't he? He tells us enough we need to know. And he says, I want you to go take that first step. Don't worry about the second, third, fourth, or fifth step. I want you to take the first step. And he's not going to tell us the second step until we're willing to take the first step. So, so Samuel, with a little bit of fear, he goes, and he goes to Bethlehem, and he's trusting the Lord. And, and in front of him come all these sons. Well, the first son comes, the oldest one, Eliab. And uh, Samuel looks at him and, and goes, wow, dude, big, strong, oldest. Uh, he's the man. Surely he's the one. But God didn't say that. God had said no such thing. Uh, and Samuel, uh, the man of God, Samuel, was making the same mistake that uh, the people had made before. He was judging by outward appearance. He thought, oh, this guy looks like it. God's like, not him, not the one, not the one. And we talked about how he went through every single one of uh, Jesse's sons before. There was the last one. And, and Samuel's like, dude, what's up? Where's the last kid? You know, and he, oh, he's out in the field watching sheep. Ah, vegan, yeah, 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 you little one, yeah, yeah, you know. And God was like, call for him, call for him, you know. Guys, let's not make the mistake uh, like Samuel did of judging by outward appearances. Um, God sees deeper than the outside. God looks at our heart. God sees the heart of every one of us here this morning. God knows those of us who are genuinely seeking him, and he knows those of us who are faking it right now. He knows what we did last night. He knows what we'll do tomorrow. He knows what we're wrestling with. He knows our doubts. He knows all of it. He knows us. He knows us, and he loves us, and he's calling us, and that's so good to know that. Uh, we, we kind of talked a little bit about how God looks at situations a little differently than we do. We tend to use our eyes when we look at things. God, God looks, not only does he look into the heart, but, but, but check this out, guys. We've been given the mind of Christ. And I think when we look at situations, we need to look and, and think about and, 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 and look into situations with the mind of Christ, not just with our physical eyes, because the Holy Spirit wants to reveal something more, something greater. Uh, so God uses David. We're going to see that as we continue to study. But he uses the one who is often overlooked. And I think there are those here this morning, maybe you, if, you, if you've not wrestled with this in your past, you might wrestle with this today. You feel like you're just overlooked. Look, let's be honest, in a place like this with this many folks, there might be a spouse here this morning who feels like your spouse has overlooked you. Word of encouragement, the Lord has not overlooked you. Word of exhortation for your spouse, don't overlook your spouse. Okay? Um, God's, not in, God's into the business, if you will, of being with the one who is overlooked. Not only is he with him, but he calls him. Not only does he call him, but he empowers him. Not only does he empower him, but he uses him. And he changes the world of people who are overlooked. So if that's you, uh, you might just be in great, great company. Because uh, God wants to do great things in the kingdom through each and every one of us. Praise him for that. So today we're going to see David, the shepherd boy. He's going to start off with a, in a very simple very, very humble, somewhat natural kind of, of way. Uh, we know the Holy Spirit is with him. We'll reread verse 13. And, uh, and, 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 and we're going to be reminded that if God has given us something, doesn't matter what it is, if God has given us something, we need to be faithful with what he's given us. And we'll look into that this morning. Not too many verses today to look at. Let's read together 1 Samuel 16, beginning with verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. This is David. He's anointing. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing or an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So Saul said to the servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor-bearer, 
Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. And we'll stop there. Interesting verses, some neat, uh, neat things to ponder here, neat things to, to pull apart and see what the Lord has for us. So there's two primary players in today's drama, if you will. There's Saul and there's David. And um, let's just start by saying there can't be two kings. There can't be two kings. We have a little bit of a problem here because Saul is king. Um, but the process of Saul being stripped uh, or having the kingdom stripped from him has already begun. And the process of David being raised to power has begun. And it's not Saul that's doing this, and it's not David that's doing this. We'll see beautifully this morning how God is, has, has gone and continues to go before them to be the one uh, to make this, to make all this happen. Uh, Saul is going to fade, and David is going to rise to prominence. But I will say this, Saul's not going to go quietly, is he? And, uh, and we'll get there as we continue to study through Samuel. Verses 13 and 14, there's a contrast. It, it's very clear why. It's very clear how all of this is going to happen. And, and we're going to talk about this for a moment. Verse 13, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. It wasn't David and himself with some sheep and a lyre or a harp in the field anymore. He did go back. He did go back to the field. There's a key, key difference here. The Holy Spirit of God is with him. That means things are going to change. Yes, and it's true today. When the Holy Spirit, we'll, 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 we'll dig this out here in, in just a little bit, but when the Holy, it's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about the Holy Spirit. He is the power. And, and, and so the Spirit of the Lord came upon David um, that day, the day of his anointing. But it says in verse 14 that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. You see the transition here. You've got the Spirit of God coming upon David. You've got the Spirit of God saying, see you later, to, uh, to Saul. Again, none of this is about Saul. None of this is about David. None of this is about us. No, it's about the Spirit of the Lord. We talked last week. Easter Sunday, amongst other things, we talked about how Jesus would send the promise. Luke chapter 24, remember he was with the disciples and before he left he said, hold on because I am sending the promise to you, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to come, he's going to live in you and he's going to open your mind, he's going to open your eyes, he's going to change you from the inside out. Now, on this side of Jesus' resurrection and ascension back to the Father, on this side of his crucifixion and his, his, his death and his burial and all of that, we have the promised Holy Spirit to live inside of us as believers in Christ. And what that means is he is not going anywhere. So let's get this, let's get this straight. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, there was the presence of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, but for a season, for a time, for a specific purpose. You read this all throughout the Old Testament. And the Spirit of the Lord filled, or the Spirit of the Lord was with. We see him with Balaam. We see him with Moses. We see him coming upon Gideon. We see him coming upon Samson. We've seen him come upon Saul in our very study, and, and many, many more in the Old Testament. Saul may have still been the king. But when the Spirit of God leaves, it's as good as over. And that's what, that's what we're walking into here uh, in, these, in these verses. So let's make our first point this morning. I think this is very, very important. Um, whether it's back in the Old Testament or whether it's today in the New Testament, everything hinges on the Holy Spirit. Let us not forget the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised him. He came. He, he is here. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, if you have surrendered your life, if you believe that Jesus came and died and, and died on the cross and rose again and you have received the gift of salvation that he and only he can give, you are not alone. This is not some feeling thing I'm talking about, guys. It feels good to be a Christian. Honestly, sometimes it doesn't feel so good to be a Christian because there are certain things you aren't supposed to do, right? Uh, even with the Holy Spirit in you, there's that war between the flesh and the Spirit. This is not about some feeling. This is about the actual living person of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. I never get tired of thinking about that. 
I never get tired of meditating that I'm not alone, that he is in us and he is with us. Remember David's prayer in the Old Testament uh, when he had sinned with Bathsheba? And in Psalm 51, he prays this prayer. He says, do not cast me away from your presence, God. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That, when it comes to the Spirit living in us, that prayer isn't applicable for today. Because once we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, he's not going to be like, act your best, boy, or I'm out of here. No, he's in us. He is in us. He has sealed us with his spirit. And, um, and so we, we, we just need to remember that um, we're not earning his presence. We're not earning his power. We're not earning his help. Um, that's part of why Jesus died, to defeat death. Not just to defeat death, but to usher in the newness And that newness is that we are truly, truly not alone, that he lives inside of us. But the key here, verse 14, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And then the wording here gets a little tricky. It can get a little tricky. It says that a distressing or a harmful and evil, depending on your translation, spirit from the Lord troubled him. It can be a little bit confusing, um, and, and we don't have time to dissect this too much. But if God created all things, then God created evil, right? Was this evil spirit directly from God in that God says, I'm going to cause this evil to happen. No. No. Uh, this, and there's a, there's a difference here. We see the Spirit of the Lord, capital S, and then we see a spirit, an evil, small s. So obviously, you know, we see there's a dichotomy here. There's two very different spirits that we're talking about. Um, let's talk about this for a second. Um, you guys know insurance policies, whether it's, a, it's usually home insurance policies. They've got that little caveat in there, an act of God. Is that, is that like the only time that, the, that society recognizes God? You know, and, and they say an act of God. And in an insurance policy, an act of God is defined as an accident or event resulting from natural causes without human intervention. So like God is, God is going to send a, a tornado to wipe out my house. You know, I'm not saying God can't use that tornado to wake me up. But God is not the root cause of evil. There's no evil in him at all, okay? Um, let's think about this. Um, I say we're not going to get too deep into this, and I, well, we're not. Um, God made us with the ability to choose. We know that. And, and, and evil inevitably came as a result of, of rebellion against God. And, and yes, he allows that. Um, in a sense, God is always, well, not in a sense, in, in every true sense of it, God is always in control. God never ceases to be in control. So what he does here in this situation is he permits this evil spirit to come upon Saul. God is not uh, at the coffee shop meeting with an evil spirit saying, hey, I got a mission for you. I really want you to go wreak havoc in Saul's life because I hate him. No, it's not God. But God saw this coming, and God saw Saul's own turning from him and his own disobedience and his own desire to walk further and further away from God. So it's like God's giving Saul over to kind of what he wants. God allows this evil spirit to come and, uh, and really uh, to torment to torment him. Um, well, his, his servants are like, well, this is a form of divine punishment because they're like, well, surely this is from God. Um, those dudes knew Saul. They knew he wasn't all right. There was something wrong here. You know what I mean? They saw him. They heard him. They watched him. His servants were close to him. They weren't like, oh, Saul's the greatest. Meet them at the coffee shop off the clock. They probably tell you, this guy's a jerk. <laughs> He's just not, you know, I don't know. The um, Bible doesn't tell us that, but we can only assume that uh, Saul let his true colors show when he was with his servants, and, and they started to see this kind of decay in his life. There's a kind of a, of a degree of application here for us guys uh, regarding the influence that we allow ourselves to come under. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was a distancing and a disobedience factor uh, in Saul's life that, that was part of the reason why the Spirit of God left him. All I'm saying is this. We need to not veer away from good influence. We need to not walk away from men and women and people who are going to encourage us to do what is right. Let me tell you what, if you are in a situation where somebody's tickling your ear to do something to get back at somebody for what they did to you, the power of the Spirit of God is starting to say, hold up, I'm not in this. You know, we got to be very careful. We got to be careful. What happens to Saul? Well, he was very troubled. He was very troubled. Scripture's clear. We go on as we continue to study. We'll see, this, we'll see Saul's fits, his mental anguish, his violent outbreaks. Uh, and a lot of those would be against David himself as David was on the run. Uh, listen to what, what Samuel had told him back in chapter 15. Samuel had said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. 
Remember when we studied that? Can you imagine what would have gone through your mind if the man of God had told you, forget you, you're not the king anymore. God has chosen somebody better than you. Would that make you feel good? Anybody? (laughs) Come on, men and women of God. Come on, Christians, (laughs) right? No, it wouldn't make us feel good, not at all. And, And Saul, seriously, seriously didn't feel good about that. And it's almost like the enemy, the enemy used that. Because listen, we're going to talk about this too. I don't think Saul needed to go the direction he went. I don't think he needed to. The enemy used this, this, this word that God had spoken to, to Samuel. And, and he became a touch paranoid. And again, he grows in that. He's suspicious of his friends. He's suspicious of those who are close to him. He even sought their lives. We'll see that in chapter 22. He killed some folks. Unbelievable, the, 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 the paranoia and what it caused him to do. But it's like the enemy took advantage of Saul's despondency to drive him further downward. And that happens in our lives. If we l- Listen, if we have an off day or something happens, it's not good, which happens with all of us, right? It's like God wants to help us grow through that. But what does the enemy want to do? See, you're nothing. He wants to condemn. He wants to be right there to speak condemnation to us. He wants us to take that word, maybe even from God, a word of correction, and he wants to beat us up with it and push us further down and push us further away from God because that's what the enemy wants to do. And Christian, listen, let's not think we're immune to, let's not think we're immune to that. Look, and we could be trying to follow the Lord with all our heart. The enemy wants us to not follow God with all our heart. And I bet every one of us could make a list of things this week that happened in our lives. The enemy was like, there he is. Don't do the right thing. Y'all, you could probably think of something right now. Of course, we, because the enemy wants to push us away from God. Well, that's kind of what happened with Saul. With Saul, and uh, it still happens today. So, at the onset of Saul's attack here, and, and, and you know, as his despondency is growing, well, his servants, they're quick to spot the problem. You know, and, and they're very quick to urge him to seek out a remedy in verse 16. You need to do something about this, Saul. <laughs> and I don't know how much of that was for Saul's own good and how much of it was for their good. Like, we can't put up with you anymore, sir, <laughs> dude. Like, you need, to, you, need to, you need help. You need help. So, so, so his servant spoke up. And, and, you know, there's a word in that for us because, because we need people around us to spot problems in our lives too, don't we? Um, sometimes, you know, um, we get blinded by our, our own vision that we we fail to see that we're a little messed up sometimes and we need brothers and sisters in our lives to do that. Well, his servants, their first thought was to find a musician. Okay. I mean, if I had been one of the servants, I'd have smacked Saul around and said, wake up and follow God, but whatever, like, let's go with this. So the servants are like, you know what? You need a musician to, to calm you. Now let's, let's think about this for a second. Um, first of all, let's throw a couple pictures up, picture of a harp. Usually when you hear about David, you hear about the harp and you see pictures like this in art and art is cool, except that's really wrong. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you right now, this, this, this man to take that out into the sheep fields, uh, you know, and those crags and crevices where we're in the rocky area where the sheep are, that'd have been a little bit tough. Uh, that's not the, so, so erase that from your mind. I know Sunday school folks, little David played on your harp, hallelujah, y'all saying that. It's not, it's not what he played. Sorry to, I see I messed you up at Christmas and I've ruined some of the carols for you. Now I'm ruining this. It's not what it is. I think the ESV strikes it best, it calls it a liar. Uh, not L-I-A-R, but L-Y-R-E. So next picture is, is a picture, well now hold on, so let me, let me, I forgot about this. Let me explain this picture to you. We were in the city of David in Jerusalem. And, and please don't, don't, don't post this. Um, well, I guess we're online. <laughs> anyway, we were in, this, we were in the, the, the city of David, and um, this, this is a, a, a carving, a model of, of a lyre. David's harp is what it's called. He even said harp, but it's a lyre. Um, in real life, it would have been about, about yay big. It would have fit in a backpack, except I don't think they had backpacks back then. But, but at any rate, so there's a ton, this was one site where there were a ton of people. And, and my wife, God bless her, she's like, hop up there and strum it so I can take your picture. And I'm like, no. And she's like, no, get up there and strum it so I can take your picture. And I'm like, oh, man, come on. So I photoshopped the redness out of my face. But anyway, but that's a liar. And this particular one has seven strings on it. So a liar, you can definitely strike that picture now. Um, so I just wanted to show that to you. Uh, the, in Hebrew, it's called a kenor. Uh, in Greek, it is a kithara. Some of you who know music know that kitharas are still very popular. And some have a flat front, and then some have a, a sound box at the bottom with a hole in it, similar to guitar. So if you take the word kithara, that's in, etymologically, that's where we get our word in English, guitar, from. So David played a guitar. 
That's pretty cool. Anyway, side note. So anyway, in that day, music was thought of as having therapeutic effect. It was culturally a thing. And that's true today, too. I, I just talked with somebody not too long ago who was in school majoring in music therapy. And, and uh, you know, studies have shown that music affects the physical, the emotional, the cognitive, the social. There's a lot of, of, of you know, impact that music can make. Uh, studies have shown reduced heart rate. Uh, lowered blood pressure, cortisol. Does anybody know what cortisol is? Cortisol, I, I think that's like the stress hormone. You know, get doctors in the house. You can come up here and give this better than I can. You know, it's like a stress hormone, I think, or something like that. But anyway, it lowers that. Music, you know, can ease anxiety. It can improve moods. So let me let you in on my world a little bit. Let me lighten the mood for a moment. Uh, I had some sedation dentistry done a number of years ago. And uh, I had an issue with a tooth, and I put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. Words to y'all, don't put it off. Don't put it off. I put it off way too long. I don't like doctors. I mean, I love them, but I don't like them. And, um, and so I had to go get this tooth extracted, and, and my wife said, you really need to be sedated. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, that means they're going to put me out. And she said, yeah, they're going to put you out. And I said, I, I, I don't want to get put out. She's like, you don't want that tooth pulled without being put out. Trust me. And I'm not going to tell you anymore where I'd have fainted right in front of her, right? So I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and I have to do sedation dentistry. I'm such a wimp. I mean, I'm proud. Of this. I'm not proud of it, but I'm just I'm not ashamed of it. So I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and my wifey, I mean, Melanie was sitting beside me. And, uh, just, you know, encouragement in case the doctor had a question and I couldn't answer it. You know, that's, why she, that's the real reason why she was there. And I'm sitting here, and they, put the, they, put the, they do all the things that they do. I won't talk about it too much, but they put the oxygen thing on your finger, and I'm shaking so hard that it pops off my finger and, like, flies and, and off. And I'm shaking like this. This is back in the day of iPod. Does anybody remember what an iPod is? This was my iPod, and I had the most incredible piece of classical Christmas-themed classical music in my earbuds that I could, that I could imagine. And I'm, so I'm sitting here with this thing on my finger and with this dentist and a bunch of people standing in front of me telling me it's going to be all right, and I'm telling them, no, it's not, but whatever. And I'm shaking, and I'm listening, I'm listening to my music, and it was a really cool experience. Uh, not, um, I turned to look at the dentist, and it was over. I'm like, wait a minute. It's like all of a sudden my mouth got big and the procedure was over. And some of you think you're such a, a, a wimp. You are right. There's two things I don't like, doctors and ladders. And, and uh, anyway, so music, I get, I get, I, I get the, if, the effect, the impact of music. Music is important, important for me. Uh, moments of stress, I, I will listen frequently. I'll, I'll put the Bible on. I love to do this. Even sometimes when I'm falling asleep, you know, if you've got the YouVersion Bible app or any kind of Bible app, put the Bible on and just let the Psalms read you to sleep. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. But sometimes I listen to music. I, I Pretty much when I'm studying, I always have some sort of music uh, playing and um, you know, so I, I get the power of music personally in, in, you know, in my life. But let's, let's bring it home here. Let's be careful that we don't turn to music or anything, for that matter, stuff to drown out the voice of, of God, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can, we can change the dial or we can try to listen to something else. And God can use music and God can use a lot of things for that matter. Uh, but let's not tune out the voice of the Spirit. As we've seen in 1 Samuel, Saul has been walking further and further away from God. The true remedy... The true remedy would not have been for him to call for a, a, a lyre player, for a guitar player. You know, his, his true remedy would have been for him to come back to God. That would have been the answer. That would have remedied quite a bit. Let's make a point number two. Point number two. Be careful that we are running to our Savior and not to a quote-unquote song. And you can put anything in that blank you want. You know, not just a song, but anything. God can use anything, but let's not put that thing before God because God wants to meet us one-on-one -on -one personally. Uh, he wants to meet us by his Holy Spirit and fill us and speak to us. You know, God spoke to his rebellious people in the Old Testament. We read about this in the prophet Isaiah. There was an episode where God's people, Israel, were plotting to create this alliance with another country. Actually, it was Egypt to come against Assyria. And they're like, God, we, you know, we can't, we, we can't do this. We need, we need help. We need to, let's go, let's, let's, let's sidle up with Egypt and, and, let's, and let's do this thing. Well, what are they thinking? Yeah, it's cool. We can do this. With Egypt's help, we can do this. What should they have been thinking? With God's help, he can do this. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need Egypt, right? So, so they're plotting for this alliance. And in doing so, they're veering a little bit away from God. And God equates this treaty in Isaiah chapter 30. God equates this treaty with another nation as, as a form of rejection against him. You know, God is a jealous God and not in a bad way, but he wants all of us. 
And, and God tells them, he actually promises them, he warns them in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. He says, listen, in returning or in repentance and rest, you shall be saved. What is he telling the people? He's saying, come back to me. Why are you going to Egypt? Why are you running to a song? Why are you running to a bottle? Why are you running to the internet? Where are you running to? That's, go that's not going to help you. That's, that's going to take you out. Come back to me in returning to me, in repenting, meaning do a 180 and walk in an opposite direction, which you were walking away from me. Now do a 180, walk back to me, come to me. In that repentance, you will find your salvation. Amazing. You will find uh, in, in that rest, not in striving, but in rest. So much the same for Saul here. Instead of returning to God, though, he chose to move forward without him. Instead of repenting, he gave in to the thoughts. He let the enemy drag him further down. Did it lead to greater despondency and depression? Absolutely, I think so. Satan takes advantage. He takes the opportunity to strike fear, to bring distraction, to bring confusion. That's what the enemy does. And we've got to be very, very careful. Let me just say a real quick word here. Christian radio. Christian radio is good. There's nothing wrong necessarily with Christian radio. Um, but, you know, I'll just be honest. Like, I listen sometimes to Christian radio, and I'm talking teaching and music, but when I'm specifically speaking about music, and people are like, oh, man, that, that song is just what I needed. And have y'all ever experienced that? I've experienced that. You hear a song, and it's like, wow, that song, God, you sent that song straight to me. Beautiful, praise the Lord, amen, so thankful for that. And I definitely benefit from that, period. However, comma. I guarantee you there are people who are listening for a song and they're not opening their word. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to them through a song that a man wrote when God has given them his whole word and says, I just want you to sit with me and drink deep. I've got so much for you. So guys, just a plug for the word of God. Don't, don't neglect the word of God. Don't expect Christian radio or Sunday sermons at Thrive or somewhere else or online to do it for you. Man, get alone with the Lord with the word that he died to secure for us and drink deep. And I'll guarantee you he'll change your life. Wherever you are right now, it doesn't matter if you're in the greatest place you've ever been. You, you get into his word, you'll be in an even greater place. Doesn't mean life's going to be easy. It just means you're going to be in a greater place. And uh, with that, we move on. So Saul and his servants... Saul's so like, hey, musician sounds like a plan, except I don't know one. You need to provide one for me, verse 17. Provide one who can play well, by the way. Uh, you know, and David, David, I don't think, I may be wrong, but I don't think David had gone to the Jerusalem Conservatory of Music and majored in guitar. I don't think that was his background, right? Uh, his lyre, portable, as we've seen, it was, it was a pastime of his, probably entertainment, as he sat in the fields hours on end. I've never been a shepherd, but I can only imagine sitting out under an olive tree and you've got a bunch of sheep, and if they're grazing and sitting there, he's not playing Nintendo or... Or, or PlayStation, what is he doing? Well, he's strumming his lyre. That's kind of what, what it was. That was a pastime of his. We can kind of think that that's the case here. David wasn't a professional lyre player. God's not looking for professionals, by the way. God's not looking for, you know, professional preachers and professional musicians and professional thrive group leaders and professional hosts and hostesses and professional, you name it. That's not what he's looking for. Um, he's looking for faithful people. He's looking for people that, that will take what he's given them and do something with it. Um, he was no professional, David wasn't, but he was good. And one of his servants speaks up. And it was really good that one of the servants spoke up, by the way. We need to speak up sometimes. So Saul's in need, and one of the servants, whose name we don't even know, said, Hey, I know a guy. Guys, sometimes we need to speak up. If there's a need, speak up. If you know something, speak up. Don't keep it to yourself. You know, We learn something here from this unnamed servant. Uh, his recommendation, if you will, gain David an audience with the king. You never know what speaking up will do. So thank you, servant, for doing that. But he said, I've seen a son of Jesse who is skillful in playing. Guys, listen, let's talk about this for a second. There's something to be said for skill, right? Just okay is not always good enough, whatever we do. Now, I know I just said God's not calling for the professional. I understand that. Um, but just okay is, is not what God is looking for. Because what we have is a gift from God. What we have is a talent or whatever it is from the Lord. Having skill was important. And that's something that David developed. I remember a story years ago. We did worship. I just see Lucas. You'll appreciate this. We did worship uh, with, a, with some youth. And this one kid said, I'm going to play guitar on the worship team. And we're like, that's great. 
you know. So we signed him up for guitar, and uh, the guy who was leading that section, they came to practice. We learned some lessons in this, by the way. He came to practice, and the guy shows up with a guitar, and, um, and, uh, and the guy says, so go ahead and pull it out, and let's run through some strong songs. And he goes, but I don't know how to play the guitar. And he's like, wait a minute, you signed up to play the guitar. And he goes, no, I thought you were going to teach me. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, I'm not a music teacher, you know. So it's funny. So anyway, this kid went on to actually play guitar, play quite well. But I remember when he was just a little kid, and he's like, I don't know how to play the guitar, you know. So what I'm talking about here is skill, though. Let's make a point. Number three, every gift and talent is an opportunity from God. Let's develop it and use it well. An opportunity from God. Let's develop it and let's use it well. Where does, where does that talent and that ability come from, inevitably? Maybe, you, maybe we do practice, but practice does make us better, but it doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord, and if he's given us something, let's use it well. You guys remember the story, of the, the parable of the talents, where the landowner goes away to a land, and he, and he gives, you know, he divvies up, you know, he gives each of his servants an amount, some five talents. One he gave five talents, one he gave two, one he gave one. Uh, The five went on to make five more. The two went on to make two more. And the one, uh, it tells us in Matthew chapter 25, went and hid it in the ground. Well, it goes on to tell us in in, in verse 29. Jesus says to everyone who has, more will be given. If you have five and you earn more, more will be given. If you have two and you earn more, more will be given. But the one who hid it, it was taken. Um, Guys, that that parable is not about you've got to double double it. No, I I think if the five had made one, it would have been fine. And it's not about the one. You only have one. Even if he had doubled his and it was two. It's not about that. It's about take what you've been given and put it to use. You know, take what you've been given and use it. Use it uh, to, to, to produce something good. It's what you do with it, right? So David was more than just a skillful musician, as we read here. Uh, man, he had a reputation. It tells us in verse 18, he sa- it says that he was a mighty man of valor, um, a man of war, prudent in speech, handsome. We threw that in there, too. And it says, and the Lord is, is with him. A man of valor, th- that, that means somebody who's willing to put his life on the line for his friends. We don't, the Holy Spirit doesn't give us the backstory as to what made him what made it so obvious to the servant that he was a man of valor. But David had done something. There was something present in David's life that would lead this uh, uh, um, servant to, to conclude that he was a man of valor. Are we willing to put our lives on the line for people that we love? It also says he was a man of war. Now, I don't know. Where do they get that from? Um, David and Goliath hasn't happened yet, by the way. That's in chapter 17. So it's not like they're like, oh, he's the one who killed the giant. That hadn't happened yet. So, so he was a young boy. He was a shepherd, but he was a man of war. Uh, perhaps in addition to killing the lion and the bear that, he, that he's going to talk about, uh, you know, he would, he would attack a lion and a bear out in the sheep fields if he needed to to protect the sheep. That's a, good, that's a good way to go there. Maybe he had taken some Philistines out, you know, because they were in camp near Bethlehem at the time, which would have been his hometown. So maybe he had gotten into a little skirmish with, with some uh, Philistines. We don't know, but he had a reputation. He had also been heard speaking wisely. It says he was prudent in speech. And uh, he must have been heard enough to have this reputation. I don't think this servant was making all this stuff up. Um, what's our reputation, guys? What do people know us for? Are we known for being men and women of valor who are willing to put our lives on the line for somebody else? Are we known as, I don't know that we want to be known as men of war, but I'll tell you this much, are we, are we willing and able to guard and protect what matters to us? You know, um, are we wise with our speech or are we careless with our speech? So these are good things, but most importantly was David's reputation there at the latter end of verse 18. Um, it says what? The Lord is with him. That's it right there. David had a reputation. God is with this guy. Guys, when we have a relationship with the Lord, the side of the cross, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we, and we live f- for him, and he is with us as he promises us, that is going, it should, it's going to make a mark in our sphere of influence. And our sphere of influence is pretty big, by the way. Listen, don't sit at home. Keeping your faith to yourself. Don't do that. Matthew 5, 16, we're the salt and light, right? What good is salt if it loses its saltiness? What good is light if you put a, a cover over it? We've got to take our faith. We've got to live that faith out even in moments of messiness. 
We don't have to be afraid to make a mistake and I need to stay home until I become a professional Christian and I know I'm not going to slip and say or do something that's wrong. You'll be at home the rest of your life. We'll never make it. We're all going to make mistakes. But let's take the living spirit who's living in us, the living word that he's given in us, to us, the relationship, not just a story, but a relationship that we have with God through Jesus. And let's go live that out everywhere we go. And David apparently more than just on the hillside by himself had been doing that because he had a reputation. He was known, hey, the Lord is with him. Point number four, in all I say and do, may others see the presence of God. There's a, always been a movement in, in, in Christendom to try to be undercover Christian and look and act and speak like everybody else so you can blend in with the world and then when they least expect it, give them a little Jesus. Guys, don't do that. Now, y'all hear this every third sermon, so I'm going to repeat it again. At the same time, don't be what? Don't be fake. There's another word I use all the time, what? Don't be what? Oh, thank you. Don't be weird. Don't be weird about it, okay? Um, we don't have to do what the world does. We don't have to be like the world. We don't have to look like the world. We don't have to do that. We can be who the Lord has made us, and we can join in other spheres of influence and have an influence for Jesus. And that's what it is, you know? David, David didn't go do the bad. Well, I mean, David sinned. But what I'm getting at is he didn't garner a reputation as the Lord being with him by doing the same thing everybody in the world did. David stood out just a little bit, and we need to stand out just a little bit and take advantage of these opportunities um, that we have to shine his light. So anyway, David had been anointed. By Samuel, um, but you know, at this point, David doesn't have any clear direction from God uh, about being the king. So, you know, it became evident that he went back to the fields to shepherd the sheep. Okay, imagine he had a whole vial of oil, uh, you know, horn of oil poured over him, and he's dripping, and he's like, blah, 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 and oil's flowing. He's like, what is going on here? The Holy Spirit came and said, oh, that's what's going on. But in the meantime, I'm going to go back to shepherding. So he's wiping the oil off his face as he goes back to the field to continue to watch his father's sheep. Interesting, David was on his way to becoming king, but his presence in the royal court all started because he played the guitar. I'm just going to call it a guitar, kithra, lyre, whatever you want to call it. That's, that's so neat. It wasn't his shepherding skills that garnered him a spot in the king's court, a court of leadership. Hello, the king is the leader, and it wasn't David's leadership skills that garnered him that spot. It was a talent that God had given him. It was an ability that he had, that he had developed over the years. So in that, guys, let's not say the power of the Holy Spirit was wasted on a shepherd boy. Remember when he was anointed, it says the spirit of the Lord was upon him from that day forward. What do you need the spirit of the Lord for? To go back to a sheep field and watch sheep and play the lyre. We need, what, did we, what was the first point? Everything hinges on the spirit of the Lord. And we want to make a point here. Number five, the Holy Spirit is with us even as we engage in the little things. I'll say this, and I don't know if it's exactly true. It's a point I'm, I want to make, but I don't know. You, just hear, hear, hear me out, because this is unscripted. You need just as much Holy Spirit to be kind to your neighbor as you need to be the preacher of a church. It's the Holy Spirit. Don't disdain, well, I'm, I'm just a neighbor. What is that? With the Holy Spirit, it's a lot. It's a big thing. Here again, we see God take David from the sheep field to the throne. Who's the forerunner of Jesus Christ? It wasn't Saul. It was David. What did he start out as? A smelly shepherd. How many of you guys disdain where you're at right now? You're like, oh, where I'm at, I don't feel like I'm ever going to get anywhere. You will. Give it to the Lord. Trust him to work with you right where you are. I guarantee he's going to take you somewhere you never could have imagined. Amazing. Engage in the little things. So Saul went, sent for David. It appears Jesse, his father, let him, let him go pretty easily. He sent some gifts with him for the king. Um, interesting that David never vied for his position. He never fought for it. He never pushed his way into the king's presence. He didn't flaunt his resume. <laughs> what would he have said? 
I'm a guitar player who can watch some sheep. Oh, yeah, you're going to be the next king. Not exactly. <laughs> Without the Holy Spirit, what is that, right? So he didn't, do, he didn't do any of that. He didn't do any of that. We're going to read later on in 1 Samuel 18. David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And we read the same thing back in, in Genesis about Joseph. The Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Why? Because his heart was after God. If our heart is after God, you guys... Oh my goodness, what the Lord is going to do in us, what he's going to do, what he's going to do through us. So David appeared before Saul. It says that Saul loved him greatly. For now, that's going to change as we continue to read, read here. Um, Saul's going to continue to walk further and further away from the Lord. Not only was David the chief musician, but we learn in verse 21, he became the armor bearer to Saul. That's huge, you guys. We've talked about armor bearers before in Scripture. Uh, you know, that assistant in battle, they had to be trustworthy. They had to be courageous. As a matter of fact, a soldier's life was often in the hands of his armor bearer. Saul trusted David. David was truly a man, a man of God. But little did Saul grasp that this young man was a king in training. He was getting some on-the-job training of, of what it's like. Um, I remember my first job uh, in sales, and um, I did not go to college to be a salesman. Um, I don't think you'd do that. Why in the world would you do that? But anyway, so my first job was in sales, and I, and I was in store management first, and then I got hired into my sales job. And uh, that was good at the time. It was actually a really good thing. The Lord used it in many ways in my life um, because, you know, I'd all, it was paint, by the way, in case any of you are interested, not that you care. Um, but it was paint, and I would sell a bucket of paint to a homeowner, or I would sell... 5,000 gallons of paint to the folks who painted the skyscrapers. But the point is, you know, I, I reminisced when I was doing that. I would, I would sit there on my lunch uh, break in my car in the amongst of notepads and order forms and, and big cell phones like this big back in the day. I'm dating myself. And I would sit there and go, gee, wow, this is what I've always wanted. When I was a kid, I remember going, when I grow up, I want to sell paint. No, I'd sit in my truck and go, what in the world is this? How many of you guys feel like that sometimes? What in the world is this? Is this what life's going to be for me? But guys, in, in retrospect, when I look back, I see that God did things in me and taught me things that I never would have learned elsewhere. Don't disdain where you are. Be faithful with what you got. Be faithful with what he's given you. Be faithful where you are because you know what? Even where you are, that might be where he's going to have you the rest of your life. And if, if you are where God Almighty has you for the rest of your life, then you're in the best place you can be. Right where you are. And the enemy's like, well, you climb one more rung. Do whatever. Fudge a little. Climb one more rung. See, the enemy wants us to climb one more rung. And God might be saying, no, where you're at is where I want you. It's okay. Maybe he does want us to climb rungs. But, and David sure climbed the rung. David pushed the entire ladder underneath of him and donned the throne. But it wasn't in his own strength. And he didn't vie. And he didn't flaunt his resume. Like I said, God took him there. If God wants us somewhere different than where he has us now, he's got to be the one to get us there. Because if we claw and grab for it, we're, we're going to hate it. It's not going to be. It's, it's not what he has for us. Not at all. Do I still have a point? I do. Last point. So anyway, yeah, David was a cool dude, man. And he, he pulled his lyre out. And he said, I'm a stinky shepherd, but I can play a mean lyre. I've practiced. Hear me. Guys, if you play a, mus a musical instrument, practice. Practice. If, you, if you're an athlete, practice. If you're a speaker, practice. If you're a farmer, well, I guess you can practice. You just, you know, it's what you do. What I'm getting at is if God's given you something, don't go, eh. no, if it's from him, get good at it. I mean, you don't have to be professional. You don't have to beat anybody. Just spend some time and energy developing that talent and watch what God can do. How did, how did he use it? The biggest way he used it right here in these verses, number six, uh, point for us. May God use us to refresh others. And that's exactly what David did. He refreshed Saul. Yeah, but Saul was mean. He, he shouldn't have been. Don't judge Saul. Way to go, David. You made somebody feel better. That's the least that he could do for him. It's very good. Worship team, come on up. We're going to close in some songs as we reflect. Um, let me just highlight a couple things as we, as we close our service this morning. So faithful with what you've been given. David was faithful with a liar, and we saw where it took him. How, how can we, again, how can we be faithful with what we've been given? Well, first of all, number one, let's recognize, let's acknowledge what we've been given. I'm not saying be cocky and conceited. 
But if there's, a, if there's an ability that you have and a talent that you have, if you hold that or hide that, what good is that going to do? So first of all, recognize it. Recognize it as a gift from God and thank God for it. Secondly, develop it, like I just said. Fan it into a greater flame. If it's a skill, use it, practice it. You know, take advantage of opportunities. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. That verse does not say whatever you do, eh, okay, it's good enough. No, because whatever it is, inevitably, if it's from God, then I'm worshiping Him by using it somehow. It's reflecting the God who gave it to me. So let's develop that. And then let's not flaunt it or let's not seek to use it to claw our way to the top. But let's give it to God and let's use it for him. Once again, I repeat, David did not flaunt his resume. His talent and his reputation spoke for itself. You know, and may that be true for us. Uh, Again, David didn't go to them, hey, I think I've got what you need. They came to him. They sought him out because he had that reputation. Likewise, don't hoard it. Don't hide that gift. Uh, We've got to give it away. We've got to use it for others. We've got to seek to take it and bless others. And the same thing is true, and I won't get on a rabbit trail, but when it comes to spiritual gifts, it is for the edification and the profit of all. They are not for myself to go, oh, look how cool I am. God gifts each one. We read about it, 1 Corinthians, we read about it, Romans. He gives us these gifts for the benefit and the blessing of of other people. We've got to be together in this. So such a huge thing. David was faithful. Again, he didn't, God didn't say be a professional, be a headliner. Uh, he didn't say go be successful. No. Uh, he said, you know what? I recognize you because you're faithful. And you've been faithful with a little bit. I'm going to give you even more. So guys, let's be faithful with what the Lord's given us. Let's look for him. Let's look for his power in the little things. And, uh, and, and watch where he'll take you. Amen. Um, Father, thank you this morning for the lessons that we learned uh, from, from a, a little boy named David who played a little musical instrument. But Lord, in, in, with, the, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God, you used him. Lord, you used him to give us the longest book in the Old Testament. You used him to pen songs of worship. You used him to set examples for us to follow. You used him as a warning, Lord, of things not to do because we're human. He was human. He messed up, and we get to learn from his mistakes, God. Lord, we're all broken. Lord, every one of us is broken, but Lord, when you come and you put us together again, you recreate us, and you fill us with your spirit, that's when life begins. Father, I pray if anybody here this morning is trying to live in their own strength and they're just living for their abilities, God, that they would recognize they do not have a saving relationship with you. That, Lord, they would recognize that you have come and died for them and rose again and beat death to give them new life. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to the one right now, the two, however many. Lord, if there's one who wants to recognize you as the Savior and Lord of their life and to know that you did that for them to give them new life, that they would turn their life over to you right now by confessing their sin and just accepting the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for going to the cross to take our sin and, and, and Lord, to give us newness now, Lord, like we talked about last week, Lord. So take these broken pieces that we all are, Lord, and, and put us together in the way you want to put us together and use us for your glory, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen.